Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. We are living in the most exciting times in these final days before Jesus returns to collect his bride. Welcome to More on Christ. I'm Pastor Glenn Moore, where we're all about encouragement and everything. Well, it's all about Jesus, our Lord and Savior that promises abundant life. Well, we're in a series called Onward Christian Soldiers. Last week we talked about empty altars have no fire. So when you put no sacrifice on the altars, there will be no fire from God. But always throughout the Old Testament, Fire fell on altars that were full of sacrifices. Fire was always and still critical in the life of God's people. It's critical in the life of the church today. Now we live in a dark world, but we're not of this world. But many times in our Christian life, the fire in our life can be extinguished by the winds of darkness. You know, we're around people and people say things to us. If we're not focused, the fire in our life, which could already be at a small level because we're not doing all the things necessary for it to be bright. Now, God wants us to have a bright fire. He wants us to live in the baptismal fires of Jesus. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. So lighting the fire is very critical. The bottom line is this, that God is a consuming fire, all consuming fire, Hebrews 12, 29. Now the fire does amazing things, and that's one of the things we need to really stress all the time in our personal life, in our church life, because when the fire is moving, everything's going to come into the sweet spot. In other words, it's going to come into alignment, just like a key fits into a lock and you turn the key and the door opens. When we are in alignment with God, everything flows and God opens not one door, but many doors. So when the fire is on you, there's going to be a lot of doors opening. There's going to be great things happening in your life. Now, why does this matter? Well, there are so many distractions in life. There's doubts, there's fears, there's worries. We get bad news and we don't always handle the bad news well. Sometimes the bad news can crush us. And we walk around with discouragement, and depression, loneliness. We don't know what to do with it sometimes. Sometimes it's the sin of addictions that we get caught up in that just take our focus off. And we need the fire of God to fall upon us afresh and anew and burn out all of the impurities in our life. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto myself. So when we lift up Jesus constantly, he's going to draw us into a greater place. The fire of God, when we keep lifting up Jesus, the fire comes down and does great things in our life. Here at New Life Church, the fire is falling all the time. That's what we want. On the altars in the Old Testament, the fire was to stay continually burning. So light the fire again. That's a great song by Brian Dirksen, and he sings that song. I love that song for many years. It says, don't let our love grow cold. I'm calling out, light the fire again. Don't let our vision die. I'm calling out, light the fire again. You know my heart, my deeds. I'm calling out, light the fire again. I need your discipline. I'm calling out, light the fire again. We need that. Light the fire again, Lord. Come and do great things in my life. We see in the Old Testament the pillar of fire over the tent of meetings in the wilderness. Now, everyone could see the pillar of fire coming down. Moses, so Moses experienced the pillar of fire. He experienced the burning bush. He saw the fire holding back the Egyptian army. So Moses, well, Moses had good faith. Moses walked with God. He had an intimacy with God that is amazing. 
Now, you and I get to have that intimacy with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to do great things in our life. He wants to use us. He wants to direct our steps. He wants to give us divine appointments. He wants to do amazing things. And he wants the fire to move from you to the next person you're talking to. God wants to use us. So let's take a look and go back a little bit at the beginning of when they were about to move into the land of Canaan. And God said, I'm going to go before you as a fire and I'll deal with the enemy. And that's what God does every day in our life. He goes before us as a fire. When you are in the fire with the Lord Jesus, great things take place. Now, the book of Deuteronomy, it's a covenant book. The whole book is about God's relationship with you, with me, and God's people. It's kind of called the second law, actually. And what that means is that Moses, for the second time, he's repeating it. He repeats, he repeats, and he keeps on saying it to the people of God, do this, do this. And God says in his vision for his people, I will provide, I will give you a vision, I will protect you, I will give you laws, precepts, regulations, statutes. Things that you need to do, the Ten Commandments, what I want you to do to keep you pure. Now, why, why was that? Well, we're going to read that in just a moment in Deuteronomy chapter 4. And Moses is addressing the people. This is what God wants you to do. And he talks about the fire. He talks about possessing the promised land. He talks about experiencing the fire of God. He's talking about don't forget. Now, these are all important principles in our Christian life. Don't forget. And possess the promises that Jesus has given you. And that's what happens. A lot of people never possess. Well, they don't teach that everywhere. So we must possess the promises that the Lord Jesus has given us. Like the abundant life. I will give you the abundant life and life more abundantly. Focus on me. Follow me. Abide in the vine. John chapter 15. The abundant life. John chapter 10. These are just basic principles of vision with the Lord Jesus. And when you do those things, you're going to be an overcomer. God said, be an overcomer in the book of Revelation. He who overcomes, I will let you be with me in my kingdom and in heaven with God. We have to overcome. There's some overcoming to do. And we overcome in the name of the Lord Jesus when the fire is on us, when the fire of God is on us when we're living in the baptismal fires. That's when things get great. So why all the rules and all the regulations and statutes and the Ten Commandments and how the priests respond? Why so many? Here's the reason. The reason is Israel was surrounded by all kind of nations that sacrificed their children in the fires of Baal and Molech. I got sacrificed, firstborn, because we want to control climate. We want to make sure that we'll have the proper rain at the proper time. We want to make sure that the sunshine comes at the right time. That's why they did that, to appease the agricultural deities. Now, that's just demons, basically. The demons had tricked them, deceived them. You know, that's what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10. The devil comes to lie still and cheat you and deceive you and kill you. And in the Old Testament, there in the land of Canaan, that took place. Genesis chapter 15, when he made a covenant with Abraham, he said, now, your people will go down to Egypt, and they'll be there four generations. That is 400 years. And he said, the cup of wrath is not yet full. In other words, there's sin in the Canaanite people. Not full yet, but it's getting there. And God says, I have patience. I'm working on them. Abraham, I sent you there to be a light and for them to make some changes. But they didn't make the changes. And God said, that's it. The land is polluted. You have shed innocent blood and is calling out to me for vengeance. Now, the shedding of innocent blood is a very powerful theme all through the scriptures. It's all through there. He warns against do not shed innocent blood over and over and over. And now the world has shed innocent blood with the abortion of innocent babies. That's murder. And God says that's shedding of innocent blood. And I will exact vengeance against all of my enemies that put their hand to do this. So you say, well, how do I play into that? Well, we need to pray that this country would be free of innocent blood. There's a pollution flowing through our land. We need to repent. 
2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Repent, and perhaps God will heal our land. So pray. That's what these next 59 days are all about. Pray that God will give us favor and a stay of execution because there's no way that's going away. That innocent blood is not going away. God always avenges innocent blood. So God said, when you go into that land, do not adapt the customs of the people around you. And what he basically told Joshua, he says, do not leave anybody alive because they'll contaminate you over time. They'll, have, they'll never give up their customs. They're bound to curses. They can't give them up. Only through the blood of Jesus can you be free of all the things in this dark, dark world. Only through the blood of Jesus, when he died on a cross, he shed his blood so that you and I could have our sins forgiven. He took your place. How about that? He took my place. How wonderful that he did that. And he died on that cross. Now, as you study on that and meditate on it, you begin to see that he did take my place. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But if I confess with my mouth and I agree with God that I have sinned, and I believe that God sent Jesus to take my place and pay off my sin penalty for the wages of sin is death, and I agree to serve him, and I choose Jesus as my Savior, and I promise to serve him all the days of my life, and do what he does, and say what he says, that when the rapture occurs, boom, out of here. God is coming for a people that do what he says. So God says, I want you to be a light. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. So we have to live in the fire. The fire does everything. So Deuteronomy 4, let's read. It says, now listen, Israel, listen carefully to the rules and regulations that I am teaching you to follow so that you may live and enter and take possession of the land that God, the God of your fathers, is giving to you. That's Abraham made that promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, don't add a word to what I command you, and don't remove a word from it. Keep the commands of God, your God, that I am commanding you. Verses 3 through 4 says, you saw with your own eyes. In other words, you saw something about God with your own eyes, God, what God did at Baal Peor, how God destroyed from among you, every man who joined in the Bel Peor orgies. In other words, who defiled themselves with people, other people. But you, the ones who held tight to God, your God, are alive and well, every one of you today. So, God has saved you and kept you in a perfect place. So many of us, we have so many problems that we just get overwhelmed. So let God's promises overwhelm your problems. Now that's a great thing. Let God's promises. His promises are yes and amen. We must possess the promises Jesus gave us. The people of God in that time, they, they, their job was to possess the promised land. And the first generation come, they saw the light, they saw the fire over the tent of meetings all those days in the wilderness. But when they got to the Canaanite land, they saw giants and oh, it, right Give them doubt, give them fear, give them worry. They didn't think about the fire over the tent of meetings. Because they said, well, wait, <laughs> we got the fire. We have the cloud. God destroyed the Egyptian empire. We can take this. And two men, Joshua and Caleb, made such a proclamation. And they did. They possessed the land. Today is your day to possess all that God wants you to possess. Today is the time. Now, in the wilderness of Christianity... The sands are hot. The mirages are always wrong. The sinkholes, there are sinkholes in the desert you can go down in and never return. It's like quicksand. You can get caught up in the wilderness of doubt, fear, worry, complaints, and never get, never get to the promised land. God wants you to arrive and take possession of of your promises. Onward Christian soldiers. He wants you to be a powerful soldier. He wants you to do great things. He has ordained it that you would be a great, great Christian for him. He's chosen you. He's equipped you. And now he wants to bring the fire upon you so that the fire will remove all of the impurities and make your faith precious like refined gold. And when your faith is strong, oh, you don't have to worry about doubt and worry. And fear. God is with me. Wherever I go, the 
fire of God will fall upon me and he'll give me favor and blessing wherever I go. God is working everything out for my good. And that's a great verse to memorize, Romans 8, 28. He's working it out for my good, everything. And if God be for me, in verse 31, who can be against me? Nobody. Doesn't matter who comes against you because God is for you. And that's exactly what the children of Israel should have known. God's for us. He's brought us out of darkness. We no longer are slaves. We are free people. Possess the promised land. So they had to wait many years because they said, well, we can't do it. No, they could not do it. There just are some things that you and I can't do. But the fire of God can do it. He can do all things. All things are possible with God when you're in the fire. There is nothing impossible to you. Today, God wants to heal you of that sickness. Today, God wants to take away those bad memories. Today, God is saying, forgive that person. It's time to forgive. Put it down. Leave it in the wilderness of sin and move to the promised land is what God is saying. So he says, pay attention. I am teaching you the rules and regulations. In other words, take possession. Ownership is what he's saying to do. It's time to take ownership of what I've given you. Own it. And say, well, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. Whatever he wants me to do, I'm going to do. Now the next principle we'll come to is a thing called worship. Worship glorifies God. The people saw what God did in the delivering them from Egypt, the fire, the opening of the Red Sea, they saw things. They were in awe of God. Now, awe and reverence and respect, that's where we need to be. When the fire of God comes, we'll be in awe and reverence and respect. So when people hear and see what's going on, they'll say, now this is what God once said about him. He says, these nations that surround you, this is what they're going to say. When you live according to my words, this is what they'll say. What a great nation, so wise, so understanding. We've never seen anything like it. Yes, what other great nation has gods that are intimate? Now, this is the question from God through Moses to the people. What other great nations has gods? In other words, they don't, their idols are not intimate with them. The way God is. God is with us always, ready to listen to us. And what other great nation has rules and regulations as good and fair and revelational as the ones God has given us? He's given us all the secrets in this book. This is the bestseller of all times right here. The greatest book ever, ever. There'll never be a book greater than this book. This book holds everything you need to possess the promised land. When you read this book, it'll just lift up and go right into your spirit. Jesus is the word of God. As you read this book, just Jesus will just move into your life. Now, praise and worship gives God the glory. When you praise God all the time, when you worship God, when you got worship music on in your house and you're doing the dishes, whatever you got to do, working on the car, working in the backyard, whatever it is, and you're worshiping God and meditating on God, God inhabits the praises of his people. God says, I will light the fire again in your life. I'm going to light the fire again because you want it. And you're coming to me. I'm going to light the fire again in your life. I'm going to move everything out of your life, all your problems, all your worries, all your doubts, all your fears. I will give you beauty for ashes, God says. I will turn your mourning into dancing. It's time to dance before the Lord. It's time to give God all the glory for what he's done in our life. It's time to know that God brought us out of a tough place We've been forgiven of all of our sins. In Jesus' name, all things are possible. Oh, God wants us to do great and awesome things. That's why we have all these stories in his word. Samson, King David, all the men in the great chapter in the Bible, the faith chapter, Hebrews 11, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. God wants us all to move into that chapter and live in there and say, if they can do it, God will put the fire on me and I can do great things for God in my neighborhood. He will inhabit your praises and he will turn around your situation. Right now, God says, I'm going to turn it around for you. Just give me the glory and say, God, you've got it. I don't want it anymore. I want to experience Jesus every day of my life. I want to live in the power of the Holy Spirit every day. I want the fire of the Holy Spirit to burn in my heart. 
I want to recall the verses. You know, the great thing about the Holy Spirit is you, when you read the Bible so much, he begins to remind you of the themes. He begins to lock those verses into your spirit. And all of a sudden you'll be thinking, and here will come a verse. Boom! No weapon fashioned against you will prosper. The great power of the Holy Spirit. And some of the songs that we sing, the scriptures are all through the song. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice. It's time to rejoice where you're at right now. It's time to say, God, it's true. You made this day. You created me. And I will rejoice and I will be glad in this day. I will do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. Use me as a tool in your hand. Now, I love this next section of scripture. In verse 9, it says, just make sure you stay alert. Moses says, keep close watch over yourselves. Don't forget all that. Uh -huh. Don't forget. Don't forget anything of what you've seen. Don't let your heart wander off. Stay vigilant as long as you live. Teach what you've seen to your children and grandchildren. Don't forget. Oh, I like that. I won't forget. I won't forget what Jesus did for me on that night long ago. Easter of 1973. I won't forget. I'm never going to forget how great he made me feel when I went forward and gave my life to Jesus. I got up from there. I knew at that moment, I knew I had no fear of death. It didn't matter anymore what happened from that point on. I now belong to Jesus. Oh, and I want to serve. I'm never going to forget what he's done for me. I'm never going to forget when I'm walking through an airport and don't know anybody anywhere. And I hear that small voice inside me saying, don't worry, I got your back and I got your front. I'm with you. You don't have to worry about anything. I have surrounded you with favor and blessing. Never going to forget what he's done for me. I'm never going to forget what he does for me every week. I want to give God the glory and the testimony. So never forget, saint. Never forget. Keep on telling other people about this is what Jesus did for me. Sometimes I see people said, you know, I want to tell you what the greatest decision I've ever done in my life. And they'll say, well, well, what is that? And I'll say, oh, when I gave my life to Jesus, that was the greatest decision I ever in my life did. And I said, well, okay, wow. I'm never going to forget what Jesus did for me. Never going to forget it ever in my life. Now, he goes on to say in Deuteronomy 4, verse 10, that day when you stood before God, your God at Horeb, God said to me, assemble the people. Now, this is very interesting. He says, assemble the people. I am going to come down and I'm going to talk to them. The clouds are going to be on Mount Sinai. The fire is going to burn. The lightning is going to flash. The thunder is going to roll. And I'm going to speak. Not you, Moses. I'm going to teach them. I'm going to teach the people. Now, that's interesting because Jesus says when the Holy Spirit comes, he will teach you and remind you of all the things that I have said to you. And God says, I'm going to teach them what I want them to do. And I want them to be in reverent awe of me, to know that there is no God like me. There's no God like me. I'm, I'm just. I'm fair. I never, ever make a bad judgment. God's never made a bad judgment one time. God's always on your side as long as you're on his side. God says, Jesus says, listen, if you abide in the vine, John chapter 15, you will bear much fruit. But if you separate yourself from me and the branch gets cut off, you'll have no fruit. So he says, if you abide in me and my words, my words, my holy words, abide in you, you will have much fruit. Now, fruit's what God wants us to have. He says, now listen to me. When the fire comes, the fire will do amazing things. And they saw it that day. They, they, they saw the whole mountain shaking. And they're we never had anything like this in our life. And God wants you to have an experience with him. God wants everybody to have an experience. To have the experience of God. Our God is a consuming fire. And our God says in the book of Revelation, the seven candlesticks, that's fire. And God wants every church to have fire on them. In these latter days, God wants us to have so much fire that we just don't worry about anything. We don't doubt anything. We don't care what people do. We care about their souls. And we care that we serve Jesus in all that we do. Now God wants to speak. And so God spoke that day. He says they didn't see his form. The glory is too great. His perfection and his excellence is so great we couldn't handle it. But when we leave this world, we'll be transformed. And we'll have bodies that are perfect. And we'll be able to see God. In fact, the fire of God is so great, he says in the new city, 
No son. It's all lit up by me. Because God is an all-consuming fire. Now, God wants to do great things. So he wants us to experience him. When your sins are forgiven, it's an amazing experience. When you delight yourself in the Lord, he says, I'll give you the desires of your heart. Jesus says, I want to light the fire again in your life. I want to get put new fire on the altars of your heart. You see, people say, well, how do I know what, what, what God wants in my life? And so logic into the brain doesn't do so much. We all know that when you feel something, it's greater. I've talked to people who said, oh, I know what I felt that night when I gave my life to Jesus. I know what I felt when the Holy Spirit came. I know what I felt. I know what I experienced. And this is what God said to the people at Mount Sinai. I want you to experience me. I want you to experience all the things about me. How wonderful it is. So experience God in all the ways that God has for you. You are special to Jesus. God chose you. He called you. He pulled you out of the darkness of sin, and he gave you a new life. So experience. Light the fire again. Jesus wants to light the fire again. You know, that word experience is an interesting word. In conclusion, it's this. When you went to get your first job, one of the first things they ask you, well, now, do you have any experience? How could I have any experience? I've never had my first job yet. I don't have any experience in work. If you'd take a chance on me, I'd have some experience. You know, when people stand before God, God might say to them, do you have any experience with me that you want to talk about? Do you have an experience with my son Jesus who died on the cross and shed his blood for you and all your sins could have been washed away? Did you experience that? We can check it with Jesus and he'll let me know for sure. But did you experience that wonderful peace, that grace, that power? Did you realize that you could be one of the most amazing people that ever lived on the planet because I would bring the fire and do those things in your life. In your neighborhood, people would co have come to you and said, pray for me. I really want to experience God. You see, God sometimes has to bypass the brain, has to do a bypass job and get to our emotions and the altar of our heart and say, listen, I'll let you experience me to let you know I'm very real. I have been around forever. I'm all knowing. I'm all powerful. I'm everywhere at once. And you'll have plenty of time and eternity to ask me questions you didn't get answered here on earth. But serve me now. And as you serve me, we'll do an OJT thing. And I'll let the fire fall from heaven. And it'll make you powerful and strong. You'll be a great weapon in my hand. I'll go before you. I'll give you favor and blessing everywhere. I'll go behind you. When I went into the land of Canaan, I led the people through because I am an all-consuming fire. I sent the word out, the people of God are coming, run for your lives. Those people were all guilty, all guilty of putting their children in the fires of Baal and Molech. They sacrificed their children to demon idols. And that's going on in this world today. So it's time now to say, God, bring your fire to me. Purify my heart like a refiner's fire. Burn away all of the impurities in my heart that are not pleasing to you. Mold me and make me like Jesus. Jesus says, I have come to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John the Baptist says, he's the baptizer. So today, main to-do application is say, Lord, I want to experience everything there is to experience right now, here and now. Come, Lord, wake me up in the morning. I'll meet with you. Speak to me in the middle of my day. I'll praise you in my car. I want to possess all the promises that you have given me to live the abundant life. I'll read John over and over and over till it becomes part of me. I'll read the book of Acts, and I want to have my part in the book of Acts. I want to share Jesus with everyone around me. You know, saints, when you're sharing Jesus, you're sowing. You're giving, and guess what? You reap at a mighty harvest, a great harvest. Your harvest will be so great. The promises will be so great in your life that it will overwhelm the problems. It'll vanquish the fears. It will extinguish the doubt. So Jesus, come and light the fire again in my life today. Light the fire, Lord Jesus, we pray today. Father, we thank you for Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. If you haven't given your life to Jesus yet, all you have to do is agree with God. I've sinned. 
I've come short of the glory of God. I believe that you sent Jesus to take my place on the cross. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. And I choose Jesus as my Savior and Lord. And he will put a fire on the altar of your heart that will never go out. And all you have to do is just keep on coming and saying, set me on fire with your word. Set me on fire with worship. I want to possess all the promises and I want to experience everything you have for me, Father God. I want to experience the fires. I want to experience healing in my body. Right now, somebody's being healed in their body. Right now, you've been waiting, you've been saying, Lord, I need a healing. I want my healing and the fires of God will come upon you and heal your body right now. Because God wants you to experience him. And you'll run around saying, I'll never forget what Jesus has done for me. I'll never forget when he pulled me out of darkness. I'll never forget when he healed my body and told me to run on. I'll never forget how great and wonderful Jesus is. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. And thank you for the body of Christ that can encourage us when we're a little bit down. They can say, you need the fire, brother. Sister, you need the fire. I need the fire. Everybody needs their fire turned on again. Lord, light the fire again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.